Hi everyone, it's amazing to be here. It's great to do the opening keynote and thank you very much for the lovely introduction. So today I would like to talk uh, about the future and why I think that the future is now. We don't need to hang around and wait for it to happen. Also the same uh, goes for sustainability, a topic that is so important today. I would like to talk about sustainability beyond the product. The word sustainability, in the, the 80s, people usually used it to describe a business ability to grow its earnings steadily. And it was actually in about 1987 when the, for, the former prime minister of Norway said that sustainability is meeting the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. And I think it's a fabulous description, but 30 years forward, I see myself hearing this word every day, especially in the fashion industry. My, like my, my inbox is flooded with newsletters describing uh, a new level of sustainability, a new approach to sustainability, the new sustainable sustainability, whatever that is. And I have to admit, I'm confused. And if I, as a person who works in this industry for many years, get confused with it, how is it then for the consumer? It must be exhausting trying to find out what the right information is. And uh, that's when I decided that the only way to solve the problem is to go through the problem and to talk about sustainability a bit more. Why am I interested in fashion or in sustainability? Why do I care about this industry? I studied at Central St. Martins in London, and uh, before, the, before the studies and also during the studies, I had about 20 to 30 different jobs in the fashion industry. I did everything from sales assistant to delivering goods to very important customers. I worked for uh, fast fashion companies, for big fashion houses, for small startups, everything. And the reason I've done that, I had one single aim, to start my own business one day. And I have to say <laughs> that um, the, journey, the journey wasn't always easy, it wasn't always what I expected, but then finally in 2015 I founded my own company called Sabina. It's important to mention I don't come from a creative uh, industry background. So no one in my family works in the creative industries. It was purely my passion and the vision that I had. I went to a very normal school in Vienna, in Austria, where I grew up. So in 2015, I found my company, and our focus is uh, contemporary conscious fashion. It's developed, made, and created fully in Europe. Here you see some of our products. Um, for us, it's important that we use 95% uh, of it as natural fibers. We make sure that we produce in fair conditions and also, when it comes to innovation, it's very important that we push that to a new level. These are our aims and objectives, just summarized. We want to improve our product, we want to introduce innovation, and we want to explore sustainability beyond that product. And this is what we will focus on today. But just to give you a quick overview of what a sustainable product is, and that's very, like, a very short description. But sustainable products, uh, it means that the materials you choose are made environmentally, friend, uh, environmentally friendly and also that you're trying to cut down the waste along the supply chain and that the way that you produce your uh, products are fair and everyone is paid across the whole supply chain. Again, this is very short. We are not talking about the product today. We want to explore sustainability beyond that. So does sustainability stop with the product? That's a question I asked myself when I started the business. I decided to talk to the industry and see what the opinions are. What I realized is, us as a fashion industry, somehow we get detached to the emotional feeling of shopping and the desire for clothes. We are so focused on the product itself, we are so in the theory of it, we completely forget what it's actually about. And then we have that amazing product, we have that sustainable product, but does it stop there? That really got me, because that's exactly what we've done in the beginning. We had the product, I was so proud of it, and I thought it will fly off the shelf and people will buy it. Is it enough to have a sustainable product and stop there? Will people buy something just because it's beautiful? I would say the answer is yes and no. It's a bit more complex than that, but we decided to create a narrative, to create a bond with our consumer, to give them something extra on top, to make them fall in love 
with our product. And this is the formula that we came up with. These are the seven points to sustainability beyond the product. That's packaging, shipping, waste and aftercare, communication, working space, team, and customer involvement. People don't buy clothes to support the environment. They buy clothes for emotional reasons. And that's a very, very important point, because quite often we feel that having sustainability as the USP, as um, the most important part of our businesses, is enough. But to be honest, it's not. You can't compromise aesthetic. It has to go hand in hand. It has to be a narrative that pushes through the whole story. So why do we explore sustainability beyond the product? Of course, to stimulate desire and emotions, the reasons for buying. But when we talk about packaging, it might seem like such an obvious thing. When you order something that is sustainable, that's a conscious product, you expect it to be packed in the conscious packaging as well, right? But me as a customer, I have to say, quite often I would order something, it would come to me, it's a great green product, I see all the information, how the material was sourced, but then I unpack it, and it's packed in tons and tons and tons of plastic, and it's not even recycled plastic sometimes. So that got us, and we started to research, because what we have done in the beginning is using recycled, card recycled cardboard, and thought we don't have to push that further. But there are a lot of great solutions out there. So for us, the solution came through collaboration. We partnered up with a company called No Issue, and we have developed this packaging with them. So you have tissue paper featuring our um, signature print from this season, and that changes from season to season. The great thing is that it's soy, like the ink they use is soy-based, and also it's completely acid-free and certified. And the mailers are made out of corn and are therefore 100% compostable. I think the important thing here is you don't have to compromise your uh, marketing or the way you want to talk or the image or the visuals you want to present. Again, it can go hand in hand. Your packaging can be beautiful, it doesn't have to be brown, it doesn't have to be boring, but it can be sustainable at the same time. The shipping is very similar. So when we think about shipping, I think most businesses will argue and say, oh, it's important that it's as cheap as possible. But again, when you're a conscious brand, you dig deeper, you explore all the opportunities and possibilities, and the more knowledge you gain, the more responsibility comes with it. So we decided, again, we need to change something, and what we do is we have our main studio in London, in East London, and if our customers order with us online, and they're based in London as well, we use bike, <coughs> bike couriers instead of the usual um, providers, and that, of course, cuts the CO2 emission. And then uh, we analyzed our data. That's another important thing. We saw that a lot of our T-shirts and a lot of our knitwear is actually sold to Germany and Austria. So why do we ship all these things one by one from the UK? It didn't make sense. We have a small uh, knitwear studio in Vienna, and that's where we ship the T-shirts and the knitwear from now. Again, cutting on the carbon footprint. And you can do that for your production as well. You know, you can make sure that the journey from your fabric to your manufacturer to your studio is as short as possible. Waste and offcuts. <laughs> I guess this is a heavy one with my team. Again, something we ignored because we thought that having a sustainable product is enough. When you look at these images, you probably wouldn't realize that it's made out of our own production waste and our own production offcuts. And to be honest, if customers are not interested in it and they don't want to know, we don't push for it. But for those who want to know, we tell the story, we have the narrative for them. You see um, our jewelry and like hair clips and brushes, these are made out of buttons that were not used in the production. Uh, we covered them with glass beads and decided to develop new shapes. You see scrunches that are made out of uh, the offcuts of the garments, again, from our own production. And it's really interesting to see that a lot of customers would order um, the scrunches matching the outfit they're getting, basically buying something from the offcut from the very product they're wearing. And the very last picture shows uh, our crochet bags. Usually when you have knitwear production, you have a lot of yarn leftovers that are super short and you can't really do anything with it. So we decided to do bags out of them. Aftercare is another big topic, because out of sight, out of mind is not something that works as part of a conscious business model. Just because I sold an item, it doesn't mean I shouldn't care for it anymore. 
That's why we offer repair services to our customers. And we have another addition. I think everyone knows when you buy a garment and you have that label, and it's not comfortable and you cut it out, and then when you want to wash your garment, you're like, Phew, how does it actually work? What we have done is we've uploaded an archive of the fabrics that we used in the past seasons. So you can go and check out if you've done that and see how you can take care after your garments. And there is a section that describes the different materials and how to care for them and how to prolong the life of your garment because you're buying something to love it. You're not buying it for one season. Communication is a very heavy, strong topic. Communication can mean so, so much. And one channel is simply not enough. I guess that's another thing that uh, is a bit problematic in the time of social media. You feel just because you shared something on Instagram, everyone knows about it, right? It's enough. You said it, here you go. But that's not the case. And I was a bit snobby and weird with that, and my team really convinced me that newsletters are not dead. I'm very thankful for that, because what we started to do is, again, it's so easy, it's a tool that's available to everyone, but is simply being ignored. It's a great way to share information about your company without being too pushy. Those who subscribe and stay with it, they really want to know, right? Also, now, the customers is diverse as never before. You can't really say that everyone you're trying to reach is on social media. We have a lot of customers that don't use social media at all because they would be a bit older and they love the newsletter. Just having the product is not enough. Again, here, you don't want to be pushing people into consumerism if you're presenting yourself as a conscious brand. What we do is uh, we focus on the quality and we focus on information. We are trying to add the lifestyle aspect through our newsletters. Lookbooks, again, something that is so old-fashioned. People don't do that anymore. Why would you need it, again, as a sustainable brand? Do I need to print something that is thrown away? Well, why not trying to create something that people would like to keep? Again, we have the first part where you have the lookbook itself in a classy way, but then we have the plus section, and that shows the team, that shows the new materials we introduced, it has interview sections. It's presented like a magazine, a reason to keep um, the lookbook, a reason to give it to your friend, a reason to talk about the brand. And we've done a very interesting trial. For two months, we've sent orders with the lookbook and some without. And it was very interesting to see because those who received the lookbook, they were less likely to return and more likely to buy again. It means we really got them with the narrative because they bought into the story and not only into the product. And collaboration, I mentioned it a few times today. Collaboration is key. The whole thing, it's not a one-woman show, it's not a one-man show, you need to work with people. We've done um, a few really great, I would say, uh, industry-changing uh, collaborations in the past four years, and uh, this is one of them that I've picked. This is the collaboration with Pictofit and Fashion Innovation Agency, and we won uh, the Fashion Futures Award for that. It was uh, challenging the perspective of um, presentation and fashion week. Instead of having a show, we've done a mixed reality shopping experience with the HoloLens by Microsoft, where you had your own private presentation. You could uh, switch around the garments that uh, the model that only you could see was wearing. And then at the same time, you were able to buy the clothes straight away at that presentation. So that worked really well. And was a very popular project. We've done things with uh, Bria UK, which is an innovation agency trying to uh, develop new materials. We have done projects, uh, charity projects, with the wonderful Daria Daria, for example. So again, collaboration can really push the narrative to a new level. Working space. Um, yeah, this is a very obvious one, right? <laughs> but one day we sat down and we said, OK, we're so hard to our factories, we're so hard to everyone. Please don't ship things in plastic. We don't do this, we don't do that. We looked around. We had plastic bottles for water. We didn't reuse our own packaging. We were ashamed. So working space is somewhere, again, you have the tools. You can do so much. You can do so much to push the narrative and explore sustainability beyond the product. Um, it's, it's starting with little things, like having a water filtering system to avoid plastic bottles. And then the team. When I talk about sustainability and I talk about the team in relation to sustainability, 
people are confused and they tell me it has nothing to do with sustainability. This is, you don't understand sustainability, it's not how it works. Well, it does, because if you want people to be part of your vision, if you want people to join you on this adventure and change things with you, then you need to have a sustainable team ethos. If you want them to sustain with you, you need to treat them like equals, you need to be nice to them. I can't even count how many free internships I have done. And I can't believe it's still a thing. Also, exhaustion is so normalized in this industry. Is it really necessary that we push ourselves until burnouts, that we do all-nighters? I don't think so. I think, again, here we need to rewrite the narrative. We need to change that. There are other options. I think the sustainable ethos when it comes to the team is very important for a conscious brand. Events. So this is something we introduced about a year ago, I would say. Again, this all came through analyzing our customer and doing customer journeys and see how can we improve the communication between us. How can it be exciting, not boring, but at the same time, something that you don't need to explain a hundred times. We have now done three sections. Upcycling workshops, which is consumer-focused, networking events, which is industry-focused, and we have panel discussions where we combine both consumer and industry. For our upcycling workshops, you can buy a ticket, which is usually between 5 and 15 pounds, depending on the event. You bring your own garment, and we help you upcycling it. Let's say you have a jumper with a hole. We embroider something, we crochet something, we change the hem, we change the sleeve, whatever that is, we just give you little tricks and tips to prolong the life of a garment and not sending it to landfill. It's very, th these events are really popular because people learn skills, exchange, and it's just wonderful to spend your Sunday afternoon this way. Networking events. Um, since I started teaching at university, I realized how many students are craving opportunities, are craving to find the right people, to meet the right people without going to you know, a party and being really awkward. So we're doing these networking events. They're very popular within students. You come, you exchange, we invite our network, experts, and then you, they can learn from each other and uh, you know, they can just exchange what they think the future holds for this industry. And we have panel discussions. <coughs> panel discussion, discussions in a classy way, where we have a panel. Sometimes we ask someone from the audience to join us on stage, which is also very interesting, to give them an opportunity to say something. And uh, this works really well, because again, we are not trying to have this story where one side tells the others what to do, but it's more of an exchange. We are trying to sort out problems together as a team. So when I talk about all these things, when I talk about our little formula to sustainability beyond the product, I think that two key aspects come out, which is collaboration and feedback. Only with collaboration and feedback, we can change this industry for good. We can make sure that sustainability is the norm and keynotes like this one that I'm doing today are not necessary anymore. And I feel like sometimes, we treat the future like something that is far away. Oh, we still need for so many innovations to happen until we can solve all the problems we have. But what I'm trying to show here is that we have a lot of the tools available. We just need to use them. We need to make sure we adapt the things and we are really brave. And instead of waiting, we take action now. It's important to add on that politicians need to get involved as well. That's a huge topic. Regulations in the industry, are crap. They're just not good. We need to do more for inclusivity, for diversity, for transparency. And again, we can be active, we as consumers, but we as a fashion industry, all of us together, we can be active, we can address it, we can uh, voice, you know, we can raise our voices, we can sign petition. Every voice counts. It's important. I would like to finish my presentation today with a call to action. Please exchange contact with the person sitting next to you and tell each other what the next thing is that you would like to change in this industry. Because, to be honest, we never know where change starts to happen. We never know where the next big opportunity is waiting for us. And most importantly, we don't know what the future holds until we try things out. And I think what we realized is when you have a vision, in theory, 
it's worth nothing. It's just when you start doing things, this is where change happens. First, it happens for one business. Then it happens for 10 businesses. And at some point, it finally happens for the whole industry. And this is what we are aiming for. And of course, I would love you to get in touch with us as well. Please send us emails. Please uh, ask your questions, but also give us your feedback, your concerns. And to be honest, you can do that with every brand, with every, everyone out there who you would like to question, where you would like to propose something. And I'm talking about the good and the bad stuff, not only the negative, because people tend to write something just if they have something to complain about. So get in touch. My name is Sabina Rachimova. Thank you very much for having me, and thank you for listening.